Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the City Update. I'm your host Mark Aaron, Multimedia Design Manager for the City of Danville. This week we are culminating our month-long celebration of Black History Month here on the City Update. Over the past few weeks we have had some wonderful interviews with influential African Americans in our community. We began with Mayor Sherman Saunders followed by Reverend uh, Campbell at Bible Way Cathedral. Of course he was very instrumental in the civil rights movement here in the city of Danville in the 1960s. And, and this week we have a very special guest, Miss Emma Edmonds, who has done a wonderful do job compiling information about the civil rights movement and of course uh, creating an exhibit with all of that information a wonderful history lesson for any of you out there we have um, a website at the bottom of the screen we invite you to visit um, after the show to learn more about this exhibit it is called mapping local knowledge danville virginia from 1945 to 1975 and miss edmonds interviewed 10 individuals about that time period and we're going to learn a lot more about this exhibit on today's show. It made its way through Danville a couple of years back, but just recently, Ms. Edmonds uh, received a grant to create a website compiling all of that information with excerpts from her interviews over the years with these individuals. So we wanna talk a lot more about that website as well. So we're very excited to have <laughs> Ms. Edmonds on today's show. And <laughs> thanks. So thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Mark. It's good to be here. And Ms. Edmonds, I know, um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, you're a Halifax County native, is that That's correct? That's right. Uh, I grew up in Halifax County. Um, and I graduated from high school in 1963, right. the okay. year of the demonstrations. Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to get a little mm -hmm. uh, background about uh, why you became so interested in mm -hmm. the civil rights movement um, here in the city of Danville. Well, I w uh, was um, a journalist in Atlanta, and mm -hmm. I had written about civil rights um, in, Dan um, in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd been there for 17 years. And in 1996, I went to an exhibit at the Atlanta History Center mm -hmm. where um, I expected to, s it was on Southern history, and I expected not to be surprised because I'd read about Southern history. I thought I knew a lot. <laughs> and about uh, halfway through, I saw a map of the Freedom Rides mm -hmm. and saw that in 1961, the Freedom Rides had come through Danville. Right. And I thought, well, I don't, I, I don't recall anything about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was a little puzzled. And then I went on in the exhibit. And um, in the next case, I saw um, a display on the Civil War. And at the top, uh, it, which included a little uh, electoral ticket for uh -huh. Virginia. And at the head of the electoral ticket was my great-great-grandfather. Yeah. And so it was the juxtaposition of those two pieces of history mm -hmm. that was really an epiphany for me in yeah. a way. I asked the curator more about what happened during the Freedom Rides, what happened in Danville. Yeah. And he, in fact, gave me the hi history of what happened in the Civil Rights Movement in Danville. Right. And uh, I um, was sort of astounded that I knew nothing about it. Hmm. So in trips back to Virginia, I would ask people what happened, what went on. And I found a real discrepancy in the accounts uh, of whites versus the accounts of blacks mm. and the accounts of who remembered and who didn't. Mm. Yeah. And that um, really um, was motivation for me to come back to Virginia and to get a grant to start doing some, some of these oral histories to learn what happened and to also look at my own family's racial history. Right. Now, I know uh, you've been with the University of Virginia now for about 11 years uh, with that's their Office right. of Development. And yes. And that's how this all came about through the no, UVA? No, uh, I, um, I first got a grant at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities to okay. just work on the oral histories. Mm -hmm. And subsequent to that, I got a job, full-time job at UVA, and I do this on the side. Oh, okay, great. Mm -hmm. and with support from the Elizabeth Stewart James Grant Trust. Right, very good. Now, um, where does one start uh, <laughs> when you're going to compile these oral histories? Mm. Uh, where does one start? Um, I started with some of the pe uh, people who were mentioned in Len Holt's book, um, okay. Act of Conscious conscience. Mm -hmm. I interviewed a Reverend McGee, Hildreth McGee, who uh, led the 1963 um, prayer vigil. Mm -hmm. um, and I also entered Thurmond Eccles. Right. And then I went to the Danville Circuit Court and looked at the records there right. and got ideas from looking at the, um, well, they're the court 
uh, transcripts, and then the bonding records. Right. Now, how many individuals have you interviewed over uh, the years, and when did this process start for you? It started in 1998, wow. or even earlier, 96, I mm -hmm. interviewed. So I've interviewed maybe uh, probably over 30 people, including right. people in Halifax County and including some members of my family, and including mm -hmm. both blacks and whites. Okay. Now, are all of those individuals including in this map, included in the Mapping the Local Knowledge exhibit? Yes, they're included in the project, but they are not included in the on the website. Okay. Um, each oral history, uh, you know, I go through a process of editing, transcribing, da 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 da, right. all of which takes a long time. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. I'm still working on that. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, mm -hmm. where can individuals find a copy? You mentioned the website. I want to talk a little mm -hmm. bit more about that, but uh, where can individuals find copies uh, of the oral um, histories? The ones that I've completed are in the Danville Public Library. It has mm -hmm. three copies each, one in genealogy, one in the sort of the special collections and one in okay. this, you know, available to the public. Great. Averitt also has copies mm -hmm. and Danville Community College. Great. Now, what all is included in these horror? To break it down, I know we're going to go over the 10 right. that are listed on the website, right. but for uh, instance, Dr. Lawrence Clark, what all is included in his oral history? Right. And Dr. Clark's is one I'm actually, I mean, Dr. Campbell, oh, Dr. Clark, yes. you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, it would be um, a life history form, okay. giving basic information about his life, mm -hmm. uh, field notes, my notes on what the interview, uh, overview of the interview, where it took place, and then the transcript, and then any documents he may have provided that I scanned. Not any, but right. some that he right. provided are in the back, along with pictures and photographs, and many of them are also indexed. And then right. at the end is a form in which he's given his consent uh -huh. to say it's fine to share it with the public. Yeah. Now, uh, mm -hmm. talk about um, mm -hmm. the scanning process and mm. these individuals really opening up their scrapbooks and what, right. what you were surprised to find when you did, did these oral well, histories. Well, I mean, it, it's been a, a really wonderful experience uh, to have people share their stories with me and mm -hmm. to also to see their um, documents. So. I think of Mrs. Isley, who was, is included on the website, uh -huh. who had kept um, a notebook and a scrapbook with all this material and photos. Mm -hmm. And we had a scanning session at Loyal Baptist Church. Mrs. Archie, Ruby Archie, mm -hmm. beloved Mrs. Archie, mm -hmm. um, introduced me to the congregation at Loyal Baptist Church one Sunday, uh -huh. and she introduced me and the photographer who mm -hmm. took these pictures. Right. And she sort of said, she's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you can, can trust open up her. To her. You can right. trust her. So, uh, at, and she announced that we were going to have a scanning session, uh, asking people from the neighborhood and the church to bring in documents mm -hmm. about Holbrook Ross, African American history. Because right. Mrs. Archie, as you know, was instrumental in having that uh, Holbrook Ross declared a national landmark. Mm -hmm. um, so we were there one Saturday, and I was there from 9 to 5 with people, a steady stream of people bringing in materials to share. Wow. And they ranged from a photo of the board of directors of First State Bank, mm -hmm. the founding directors, right. um, to family pictures, you know, yeah. or um, early church programs, or program of the dedication of the funerals. But from the material, you really can piece together a more complex. Yeah. I'm sure a very good African American history for any of our viewers out there right. who would like to learn more about that. I'm discussing it on the show now right. for a month. And for some of the individuals who lived it firsthand, but right. um, if you'd like to go back and research it, this is a great place to start. Yeah. Miss um, Edmonds, we're going to have to take break, but uh, when we right. come back from break, I do want to talk uh, more about your website because right. you just recently launched that. We've got uh, the address at the bottom of the screen, but you said you received a grant uh, to produce yes. your website? I uh, received funding from the Elizabeth Stewart James Grant Trust in Danville. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm very grateful for their yeah. ongoing support, mm -hmm. and from the um, Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. Great. Now, what all is included? Uh, we're going to talk about the 10 individuals that mm -hmm. are included on the site, but I know there's other resources available on the site, and a, a good timeline right. from 45 to 75 right. that occurred. Right. Each individual uh, well, it's a recreation first of the exhibit, but then I have interview excerpts from mm -hmm. each person, 
a lot of annotated. And then I have something called related resources. It could be photos. It could be a court transcript. It could be a document picture mm -hmm. related to what that person said in the oral history. Great. A very extensive <laughs> website, Mary, and I invite each and every one of you to, to uh, log on after the show and, and check out the website. But Ms. Evans, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to learn a lot more about the 10 individuals that are included on your website. So <laughs> stay tuned. We'll be right back. These are the children who had no chance. They're known as Brazil's street kids. They wander the streets dying by the thousands from drugs, AIDS, and bullets. Most of them have been abandoned, left to survive on their own. These children needed a place to go. I had to do something. So I brought it up at Rotary. People heard about what we were doing and asked how they could help. Together, we raised funds to give them a home and open the school. They're learning a trade. Now hundreds of kids have a family and a future. They're contributing to the community because Rotary believes in making things better for everyone. Rotary is making a difference right now. They have hope. Rotary gives people Welcome back to this week's edition of the City Update. I'm Mark Aaron, Multimedia Design Manager for the City of Danville. My guest this week is Ms. Emma Edmonds as we culminate our celebration of Black History Month here in the City of Danville. And Ms. Edmonds has done a wonderful job capturing the oral history of 10 local African Americans and their thoughts and feelings of the civil rights movements here. It's called a Mapping a Local Knowledge, Danville, Virginia, 1945 to 1975. You can visit the website um, there at the bottom of the screen to learn more about this exhibit. And Ms. Evans, uh, <laughs> in the second half of the show, I want to talk uh, some mm -hmm. more about the individuals that you interviewed. And okay. I know you spent a lot of time, <laughs> we talked a little bit more in the first half of the show about how you compile an oral history. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, I just want to really go down the list That'd of the great. individuals that uh, the in, that our viewers will see on the website, beginning with uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Lawrence Clark. And our viewers may be familiar uh, with Dr. Clark mm -hmm. because he made a visit to Danville about a year ago right. and brought some of his carvings of um, mm -hmm. African American and, uh, teachers in the community mm -hmm. that were very influential in his life. Right. And uh, I think they were from an individual in Africa right. from his trips over there. Uh, so they may be here and remember. And can you tell me a little bit about how um, he was chosen to be on the list and uh, some mm -hmm. things that stick out in your mind from your time with Clark? Right. He was recommended by C.T. Vivian with Martin Luther King, who okay. I met. In, uh, <laughs> and um, so he was the first interview that I did. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Clark, in a way, uh, he stood it for many reasons. One, he's done a wonderful job of chronicling the history of Danville. Mm -hmm. So I have on the site... Uh, his history of Danville from the end of the Civil War to, I can guess, up until Langston immigrated. Right. Um, but the, I chose him as the first person on the exhibit because his mother had worked in tobacco mm -hmm. and his father had worked in textiles. Right. So he gives an account of what it was like seeing his mo mother work as a seasonal tobacco mm. and Know, that humiliating that was to him, right. and then also about how he wanted a better life for himself than either of his parents had in textiles or tobacco, and why he left Danville. Right. And what a, a wonderful life he has had, because I know he right. was a professor at NC State, uh, graduate, mm -hmm. uh, master's degree in mathematics, I think, if, from, right. if I can recall. Yes. Uh, very intelligent individual. Yes. And, uh, and uh, very uh, dedicated to Danville and mm -hmm. its history. He, and I know when he made the trip here with his wife, they were talking about uh, mm -hmm. wanting to create some sort of museum here right. with uh, a lot of this information and yes. artifacts that have been collected over the years. Right. Um, they had a small exhibit at the uh, Science Museum right. uh, featuring the old Winslow Hospital, which was the yes. African-American hospital yes. here, and some artifacts from that time. So I know um, mm -hmm. he really wants to see a, a museum um, here. Right. Um, in the city of Danville, recognizing uh, the African-American community at that time. Right. 
Well, um, another individual on the list was Mr. James Peters, and I think he was uh, right. an owner of a funeral home here yes. in the city of Danville. Yes. Still is. Uh, he, he currently is owner of L.H. Brooks Funeral mm -hmm. Home brother, director, I think. Yeah. Uh -huh. And um, his, fa his um, father started Peters Park, which was the um, African-American or um, a baseball park for okay. African-American competition. So he oh. tells a wonderful story of how that park started. Right. And uh, his parents, uh, his grandparents lived in the Holbrook Ross neighborhood. Okay. So he has some wonderful memories of, of those. And mm -hmm. he also is the one who told me about Charles Kenneth Coleman, who was the first African-American to run for city council since Reconstruction. Wow. And he has a g great story about how he collected money for the poll tax and then eventually he got, after he got enough people registered ran for city, city council, council himself. So Mr. Coleman very influential in, yeah. in Mr. Peter's life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now another one uh, near and dear to my heart is Miss Dorothy Harris. She was actually yeah. the principal, right. my principal in middle school at right. I.W. Taylor and I didn't realize that was one of the uh, first integrated uh, middle schools in the city. Right. I did not realize that until we had some discussions yeah. earlier, but uh, Dorothy Harris, I know she now lives in Richmond, I think, yes. with her children, but uh, yes. an educator and principal here in the city of Danville, I know, for over 30 years. Right. And she was, she was also one of the first people I interviewed. Um, and <laughs> Mrs. Harris was so fascinating. I really interviewed her three times. Oh, wow. And I, remember I was sat in this little breakfast nook, and I was mm -hmm. all bent over until <laughs> I thought my arm would break holding the <laughs> microphone. Yeah. But uh, her story stretched from Pennsylvania County, where her family, um, and, well, Mecklenburg County, where okay. her uh, parents um, lived and raised her, all the way through you know, the election of her husband as uh, mayor, yeah, mayor and then um, the integration of the schools okay. so A any mm -hmm. stories that stand out in your mind about the integration of the schools oh. because uh, I know we had Miss Wilson on last week to talk Over. a little bit about that but right. was there anything that stood out in your mind uh, during the, well, during the she, 1970? Well Mrs. Harris talked about some of the difficulties the person who really focused on it more was Mrs. Archie who's also okay. on the site mm -hmm. and who described the first prom and how yeah. white, white you know they would have whites all dancing together, then mm -hmm. all blacks dancing together, and white music, and then black music. And also she described some of the unrest in 1970. Uh, when At they George Washington. Yeah, where mm -hmm. they closed the schools for a couple of days, I mm -hmm. think. And Miss Archie, of course, was next on my list here. Of yeah. course, near and dear to all of the, uh, yeah. the citizens of Danville, a, uh -huh. uh, a mayor here in the city, a longtime mm -hmm. council member, an educator right. for 30 years in the English department yep. at, at George Washington High School. And I, I remember an excerpt from uh, one of the, the histories about uh, Miss Archie discussing Mm -hmm. not being afraid to walk the halls at GW at that time because some right. teachers were scared to even come out of the classroom. Right. But I could see Ms. Archie, you know, right. they always say small in stature but right. large in heart, and I could yeah. see her walking the halls then yeah. uh, letting people know everything's going to be okay and we're going to make it through this yep. and she be was, stronger because of it. Yeah, she was, um, yeah, that's exactly her, was exactly her approach. And yeah. um, she also has some wonderful stories, not on the website, but about her working with students and how she, she was like, uh, the tough love that mm -hmm. she gave, you know. Yeah. And, and, and you talked, you mentioned a little bit ago about her involvement in the um, Hallbrook Ross district right. and becoming a, a national historical uh, uh, neighborhood. And my, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because our viewers may not be familiar with that well, designation. The neighborhood, um, Hallbrook Ross, um, was a neighborhood that was established, I guess, late 19th century. It's mm -hmm. up across from the um, museum. Is that right. And it, uh, it's where uh, African American. Well, there were important African American churches, three okay. important churches mm -hmm. there. School, the schools were there, okay. La Langston, um, and it was also black businesses, and it was where a lot of black professionals lived. Okay. So Mrs. Uh, Archie was really instrumental in getting that on the national register. And, and when you compile these oral histories, and one reason we do this right. is because, unfortunately, these right. individuals, when they pass, right. you still have that information right. and their recollections of the time. Right. They can no longer tell it. So that makes, makes right. I think, what you've done even more important. Well, it makes me really grateful that... Mm -hmm. um, you know, I heard their stories, and I've had the opportunity to, I guess, make them more public. Like right. the Mrs. Archie, Mrs. Isley, uh, Mr. Um, oh, let's see, 
I think that those are two Two that are deceased Mm -hmm. already. So it's very sad. Um, And the next on the list is Miss Avicia Thorpe. Right. And I know uh, Dr. Clark mentioned her and actually brought her to the exhibit at the library when they honored him because she was very influential in his life. And she's got to be into her 90s. She's uh, uh, over 100. Over 100, okay. And she was a teacher at Langston. uh, Right, right. the 30s, 40s? Th- uh, 30s, 40s, 50s. Wow. 60s, I think. I'm not yeah. sure. But she, has, she was the one who, whose grandmother remembered Lee's surrender. I mean, oh she was gosh. the one person I interviewed whose memory of, of went, you know, I guess you would call it chain of memory went yeah. back that far. Yeah. So she could remember her grandmother talking about Lee's surrender and how she went and stood out by fence, not knowing where to go or what to do. Very sharp to be over 100. Yeah. I was amazed. I, I talked to her a little bit at, at the celebration with yeah. Dr. Clark. And, and she was the one that had a very extensive scrapbook. Is that correct? Uh, yes. And Mrs. Uh, um, yes, Mrs. Thorpe had wonderful materials uh-huh. I mean, that she shared and, um, you know, that included her relationships with white women during segregation. There was a group of black and white women who got, church women who got together during segregation, mm-hmm. met at each other's houses, worked on projects together. So she had, you know, some surprising things in her co- uh, collection. Um, and next on the list was, uh, was Robert Williams, who's an attorney mm-hmm. in um, Martinsville now. Yeah. But I think he w- was one of the individuals that you interviewed that actually took part in some of the sit-ins that occurred right. during 1961, right. 62, 63. And I think he sat in at the Danville Public Library, right. the all-white library, which right. is the Sutherland Mansion. Yeah. And I remember reading some stories that he told yeah. you about that time period. Yeah. Um, he um, led a he was he was active in the NAACP mm-hmm. youth group, and the uh, after the sit-ins in um, Greensboro, he led a group or was one of the people who were in a group who went to the public library. Oh, it wasn't it was the Danville Memorial uh, yeah, Library right. then, mm-hmm. and um, tried to check out books. And when they did, then the library closed. And I think it was closed for about four months. Mm-hmm. And then it reopened with all the seats taken out. Right. I mean, and Reverend Remember Campbell, that? <laughs> yeah, and Reverend Campbell actually discussed that a couple of weeks back on our show. Yeah. Uh, of yeah. That situation. Remembered it as vividly uh, during 1963. Mm-hmm. Um, another individual was uh, Charles Oliver. And some of our viewers may be because right. familiar with Mr. Oliver as he led the choir at Blue Recreation Center for right. years. I think he just recently retired from yeah. Devil Parks Recreation and he Tourism did. after... 40 years right. of service or more, uh, maybe 45. I know. But uh, amazing, and, and I didn't realize um, his involvement as a music director at Loyal Baptist. Right. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, some of the people I interviewed in this group, not everybody was directly involved mm-hmm. in the civil rights movement, but I tried to include people, to some, some people, ordinary citizens. How did they experience right. this time? Yeah. And Mr. Oliver was one of those whose portrait we took during the scanning session. Mm -hmm. And um, subsequently a student interviewed him by phone, but so I don't have a tape of his um, interview. But recently I was talking to Mr. Oliver, you know, I said, don't you have any pictures, you know, don't you have any, you know, Mm -hmm. I want to put it in your notebook. And he sent me pictures of this segregated little league team that he coached called the Medical Dents, and they mm. were sponsored by the black doctors of Danville wow. and um, during segregation. I thought, gosh, that's interesting. Amazing little piece of history. I mean, history so everybody, that. I mean, one of the things you come away with is that everybody's story is related to this bigger story. Right. You know, do, doesn't, some people got it in March, some people, um, you know, coached a little league team mm-hmm. during segregation. Some people um, contributed money f- for bail bonds. Bond, Other right. people got people to register to vote, et cetera. So the thing that was really a takeaway for me is that everybody has a story. That's right. And, and one interesting story that stood out with me was, was Mr. Hughes, James Hughes, who's yeah. the owner of a funeral home who oh. really didn't want to discuss with no. you that time. No. But he did want to discuss one part of his yeah, life, and did. that was part of a crew member of Wendell Scott's team. And right. I know all of our viewers who are avid NASCAR right. fans remember Wendell Scott, right. who was the first African-American to win a NASCAR-sanctioned race in the right. 1960s. 
he didn't receive the trophy. They really right. didn't recognize him as the winner. It was 30 years right. later where his family went down to the local track right. where he won, where they finally received the trophy. Right. But uh, a great piece of history here in Danville, of course, Wendell Scott Drive, named after Mr. Scott and that yeah. community right off of Arnett. But uh, yeah. Mr. Hughes was really excited to tell you a yeah, little bit about would, that. Yeah, he would talk about civil rights. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, uh -huh. um, but like you said, that's a little side story that, you know, when yeah. you're talking about segregation, of course, right. and the trials and tribulations that Mr. Scott faced as he tried to break into an right. all-white sport yeah. at the time. Yeah, and I think he said that Wendell Scott used to drive some of the funeral cars, you right. know, or they yeah. lent him cars to go to races, I, mm -hmm. you know. So there was a connection between his family and Wendell Scott's yeah. family, yeah. went way back. And the last uh, individual w that's on our, our list that's listed on the website, we're actually going down a list of the 10 right. individuals that are, are included on the website, is uh, Charlie Nelson, and he was a band leader here locally. Yeah. And he, he really uh, talked uh -huh. to you a little bit about uh, Dr. King's speech on the, on the mall in Washington and his oh, memory right. of that yeah. because he was a teacher here, but then he moved down, I think, right. to Atlanta maybe yeah. or somewhere into a, a larger city. Right. And uh, race relations were a little different at that time yeah. in the larger metropolitan areas. Yeah, so he, you know, again, was somebody who found the um, civil rights movement here a little unsettling, mm -hmm. like the, what was happening in his hometown. Yeah. And he found that he really connected most with what was going on when he watched Dr. King yeah. on TV. So, Again, yeah. it's an individual's response right. to what happened. Yeah. You know. Well, Miss Edmonds, mm -hmm. uh, we've run out of time on today's okay. show, but I definitely want to thank, thank you for taking the time for you. joining us uh, on today's show and taking part um, in DCC Celebration of Black History mm -hmm. Month, making the trip down from Charlottesville. And we just scratched the surface, uh, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen, on, on the oral histories that you've compiled over the last mm -hmm. 10 years. And I really do um, stress to you, please visit the website at the bottom of the screen mm -hmm. to learn a lot more about uh, Miss Edmonds' work on mapping local knowledge here in Danville, Virginia, over that three-decade period from 1945 to 1975. Ms. Mm -hmm. Edmonds, thank you for thank taking you an interest in our much. community, <laughs> compiling all this information thank and you. creating a history for uh, my son and daughter to enjoy for many years to come. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to do the project. Right. And thank mm -hmm. you at home for watching. Until next week, have a great day.